in this series this semester, as most of you know, we're covering Israel's way in the wilderness. As we look here at Exodus chapter 17, we see that the way has not yet become wandering. The wanderings begin after Sinai. Israel is now marching to Sinai, and they're going down the entire way into the Sinai Peninsula alongside the Suez, and their purpose is to meet with God. But notice very clearly here what is actually happening as we have proceeded along the Suez towards Sinai. Problem after problem after problem has arisen, and every time a problem arose, Israel had exactly the same response. They develop this, the unspiritual gift of complaining. Every time they met anything that was problematic, they said, God, why don't you care? Why have you brought us out here to die? Why have you taken us out of Egypt to have no food, no water, and now to be destroyed? What are you doing? God's response was the same every single time in crossing the Red Sea, in facing the bitter waters of Mara in the absence of food, in the water from the rock, God graciously provided for Israel's need every time. See, and the, the basic point I want to make is very clear. The message of this story, really the message of the whole Bible, is very, very clear. God's extraordinary presence is with us in the midst of our ordinary problems. Now, we might think that being attacked by the Amalekites, is not overly ordinary. However, read your Bible. Read Exodus, Numbers. Read Joshua. For the next several hundred years, Israel would have to fight battle after battle after battle after battle. This is actually one of the lesser battles. This actually becomes a skirmish. And so, therefore, God's extraordinary presence is unbelievably made clear in the great problems and in the minor problems that we face in our life. The question is, to what extent are we tied into the presence of God, and to what extent are we living in the world and basically subject to the vicissitudes of the world, almost at times, it seems, without hope? That's because we've forgotten about God. That's the whole point. I'd like us to understand three aspects from this story that is a message to all of us. The first thing is we obviously must identify the problem. We must come to grips with the reality of the situation. But when I say that, I don't mean we just identify the trial itself. We want to identify the contours of our difficulty, namely the God who is there, as well as the often tragic circumstance that is present as well. As we look at the text itself, we notice very clearly, first of all, the Amalekites have come. Now, the Amalekites were a northern nomadic tribe from the north part of the Negev who made their living in a very real extent by plunder. They would attack, you know, goods and trains and peoples who were less strong than themselves and steal everything they had. That's what's going on here. But there's a new wrinkle involved here because we need to understand who the Amalekites were, not just where they were from and how they lived. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau. And they had lived very, very much like the Hatfields and the McCoys. They hated the descendants of Jacob. And so the enmity between Jacob and Esau was lived out generation after generation after generation. Israel had strangely traveled all the way south through the entire Sinai Peninsula to the very southern tip where, of course, Mount Sinai was. But in doing so, they have drawn the Amalekites and that is a very strange situation. 
The Amalekites didn't tend to go down that far into the Sinai Peninsula. And so some have thought that this is a lot more, and I believe this is a lot more than just a desire for plunder. The Amalekites were continuing to go to war against the descendants of Jacob, against the people of God. So this is more than a desire for booty. It is revenge. And that's the situation that Israel is facing. But now let's notice how they identify their part in this situation. It's very interesting that as you look at verse 9, Moses does not consult God. There's nothing here about Moses going up, meeting with God, asking God what to do, following the direction. And so some have thought that this might not be a story about God's presence. It might be a story about Moses, the hero, who delivers his people. That's a complete misunderstanding. In reality, that's only true if you take verse 9 out of context. If you look at verses 5 and 6, Moses is still following the directions of God in terms of the water from the rock. For the Lord said, go, take the elders, take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, stand before you by the rock, strike the rock with the staff. So that Moses already knows what he is to do. He is following the directions of God. And the basic point of the story is really the complete reliance of God's people on the presence of the Lord in dangerous circumstances. The key to everything is will we let go and let God? Or are we willing to do that? But notice also, though, Moses needs more than just himself. Moses needs help. And so therefore, in all of this, we see Joshua. We see the first mention of Joshua. But we also see both the human and the divine side. This is the first mention of Joshua in the scriptures. But he's also going to be linked with Aaron and her in the next story. And the basic point is, when we face our trials, we face them together with the people of God. We are not alone, and we dare not allow ourselves to think of ourselves as alone. We are never alone, both vertically and horizontally. We are not alone primarily because God is with us. Again, his extraordinary presence is there. But we also have our brothers and sisters in Christ to bear us up. And we're going to be developing that in the second point. For now, the last part of verse 9 shows the two sides of the basic message, really, and the basic story. The first side is we must act. Notice what Moses tells Joshua. He says, choose some men. This tells us, first of all, this is not an all-out war. Moses doesn't say, assemble the entire army of Israel. He says, choose some men and go before the Amalekite, in a sense, division as they are coming against us. Most of all, though, we already see Moses obeying God. He basically says, tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. He already knows that the answer is in the staff. The staff signifies the presence and power of God at work on behalf of Israel. The staff really stands for God, the divine warrior, who fights our battles for us and goes to war on our behalf. And therefore, we do our part. We assemble the soldiers and we fight, but we primarily depend upon God who is there for us. See, and that leads then into the second part of the story, namely the solution, the solving of the problem. And in the solving of the problem, we just again... We must rely upon God entirely to alleviate the difficulties into which we are falling. Now, notice how Moses does this. It's a very interesting and almost strange story. Moses, Aaron, and Hur go on top of the hill. And Moses stands there with the staff up raised in his hand as the battle is being fought. There have been all kinds of conjectures about the symbolism and the question of why Moses did that. You know, everywhere else he struck something, whether he struck the sea, he struck the rock. Now he just stands there with it up in the air. And so 
many have thought that this is a passage about persevering prayer and holding up the hands in prayer. That is probably a part of it, but it's not the meaning of it because there's no mention of prayer here and there's no mention of holding the hands up in prayer. And so that is not the primary thrust. Others have thought it to be more general, just as many of you did as we were singing earlier, you'll hold up your hands in worship. And so therefore the idea is everything you do, even fighting a battle, is part of our service to God and therefore part of our worship to God. And so therefore the scene is all about worship. I think we'll see that there is a worship aspect to it, especially when you get into the last part today in verses 14 to 16, worship is definitely a part. But that's not the primary meaning of holding up the staff. Others have thought that it might be making an oath before God because you hold up your hands and you're making an oath. That's much less likely. Least likely of all, and it is actually found in some commentary, sometimes you wonder where the minds of these scholars are. I think scholars by nature, being one of them I can say it, scholars by nature are Athenians at heart. They're always searching for some new thing. And sometimes the new thing is ridiculous. So this one, <laughs> this one is Moses' hand was up and he had the staff up as he was motioning with the staff, giving direction to the army about where to deploy. Oh, what can you say? <laughs> That's not even a nice try. <laughs> basic point. It has one basic meaning, and that again is total reliance upon God. The staff of God is again Yahweh the divine warrior. It signifies God's presence. It signifies God's power at work. And as long as the staff is held up, that reliance is acknowledged. And it's actually not just meant to be held up, it's meant for all of the soldiers fighting in the plain to be able to look up and see God's standard and therefore to realize they aren't fighting for themselves. They are not fighting by themselves. Behind them is the hand of God guiding their hand. And so therefore the staff is upraised to show them that nothing can be done apart from God. See, that's the key, the absolute sovereignty of God, the absolute power of God, but even more than that, the absolute sovereignty of God at work for us, undergirding us, bringing victory out of certain defeat. It's the God who is there. See, that's something. It's very much 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that wonderful verse, which we normally think of as temptation, but the term for temptation also means a test or a trial. So therefore, it's no temptation, no test has ever taken us except what is common to humanity. And now we get to the key. God is faithful, who will not allow us to suffer any test that is beyond our strength to endure, but will with the test produce a means of escape that we may be able to bear it. This story is an illustration of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 in a very real way. God is providing the way of escape. God is forging the path through the serious trial. And God is providing the victory. That is seen, of course, by the simple fact, too, the Amalekites were too strong for Israel. If Israel were to fight in its own strength, they would lose, which is signified, in fact, that every time the staff is lowered, the Amalekites begin to prevail. Every time the staff is upraised, Obviously, the Israelites prevail because of God. And so the basic point, though, is also, remember we talked about earlier the human side and the divine side. God is there. God is making a way to escape. But now we see what our responsibility is in it. We must avail ourselves of the presence and the power of God with us. We must avail ourselves in the way out that God is providing. If we try to fight in our own strength, we have no hope. We will lose. We try to alleviate our problems by ourselves, we cannot win. But with God, we cannot lose. See, that's the point here. That's what it's all about. At the same time, one of the second aspect of verses 10 to 13 is the need of the community. They get back to the simple fact that Moses didn't go up on the hill by himself. Moses wasn't the general of the army. 
Moses tapped his aide, Joshua, to lead the army in the battle, as Joshua did from then on. Moses went up on the hill, understanding he needed Aaron and her to be with him. Now we know who Aaron is, Moses' brother, the high priest of the nation. We don't really know who her is, and actually we don't really know in any final way, period. Her was probably, as we look at him in the rest of the Pentateuch, her was a leading elder who was one of the leaders of Israel, who basically became, at a later time under Moses, one of the judges who adjudicated Israel at the gate and who was a leader. It's very possible here that Josephus has given us a true tradition. Josephus says that her was Miriam's husband. If that are the, is the case, you see all the major players of the exodus and wilderness wanderings are here. And the basic point is Moses cannot win the battle by himself. Primarily, he needs the Lord, but he also needs his brothers and sisters. We need each other. The simple fact is, by ourselves, every single one of us is inadequate. By ourselves, we cannot prevail. By ourselves, like Moses, our hands will grow tired. And we cannot keep it lifted up to the Lord by ourselves. Moses needed Joshua to fight, and he needed Aaron and her when he got tired. Notice they placed a rock under him so he could sit because he couldn't stand that long. Boy, can I identify with that, especially over the last couple of years when I can no longer stand to preach or to teach. That's why the stool is up here. If I were standing, I'd have to sit down about halfway through the sermon. That has happened a couple of times. It's not going to happen again. At any rate, I'm like Moses. I need the rock to sit on in the midst of it. I can hold up, but I'm holding up from a sitting position, right? Just waving my hand. At any rate, the point is we need our brothers and sisters in Christ to hold us up in the midst of the battle. One of my favorite passages in that is actually Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13, it says that the strong need to hold up the weak. It talks about the feeble knees and the feeble arms that those who are strong need to hold up and brace us up. We all need that from time to time, where we are growing weak, where we are unable to persevere. We need each other. Victor Hamilton in his commentary talked about this, and, and his point is, he says, this is an illustration of the necessity of fellowship, that we need the fellowship of God's people to lift us up when we're growing weak in the struggle. And I think that is exactly it. That is indeed what is going on here. And so therefore, the battle is fought, the victory is won, primarily because of God's extraordinary presence, secondarily because of the help of the saints in holding up, when we are growing weak, our arms. Now let's go to the third point, and this relates to the remembering of the event. After we have found the solution, we need to learn that solution and keep it in our memory. This is actually one of the primary emphases of the entire Bible. Remembering is at the heart of the Torah. Remembering is one of the primary emphases in Deuteronomy. It's one of the primary emphases in the New Testament. Notice what Moses has commanded. The Lord then says to Moses, he says, write this down on a scroll. Notice, as something to be remembered. This is so critical, and we fail in this so often. Every time we say to God, why have you forsaken me? Why aren't you there? Why am I all by myself? We are failing to remember. We need to remember our own story. We need, when we're going through this serious trial, when we're going through the difficulty, we need to bring to memory the number of times God has taken us through exactly this same kind of situation and brought us through it faithfully. And we need to remember others and the great people in the past and realize that 
all things indeed work together for good. Even though it doesn't seem like it. That's actually a major emphasis in Revelation chapter 1. In the very name of God in Revelation 1, 5, and 6, where God is called the one who is and who was and who is to come. Notice the key. It's out of order. It's not past, present, future. Elsewhere actually is that. Elsewhere in the book of Revelation is the God who was and is and is to come. There the first one is the one who is. And the reason is the people in the province of Asia, the Christians, knew that God is the God who was sovereign over the past. The entire Old Testament told them that God had been totally sovereign throughout all the past. They knew from the prophecies of the book of Revelation, God is the God who is to come. The future is guaranteed by God. What they weren't so sure of is that he's the God who is. They thought maybe God was on vacation. You know, he'd grown tired working for Israel all those centuries and taking care of the church and all the troubles that the disciples heaped on him. And so God needed a break. This was his break time and we're getting dumped on. Remember, remember, God never leaves nor forsakes. As Joshua was told, as Moses was talked about three times in Joshua 1, be strong and courageous. Why? Because you remember the God who had called you. See, so when we're about to surrender to despair, when we are wondering how we're going to get through this horrendous situation, we need to remember that God has been there for his people and been there for us every time. See, that's the key. Write it in the book. Now, we don't know what scroll is being talked about here in verse 14. It could be, actually, there's interesting, there's a book that is named in Numbers 21 called The Book of the Wars of Yahweh. There are several books named in the Old Testament that, you know, were lost in antiquity. That could be it. But it also could be the first mention of the authority of Moses to write the Pentateuch. That's not the important thing. The important thing is write this down. Make sure that you and the people never forget. See, it's a positive memory, but it's also a negative promise. It's a positive memory, God is with you. But it's a negative promise because it's about the absolute destruction of the Amalekite people. Notice Moses told the writer, partly so that Joshua will hear it. Joshua is the one who is going to carry out the directive. What's interesting, though, is Joshua never did. There was one more battle with the Amalekites in Numbers, I think it's 15. But the Amalekites were fought by Saul, by David, by Hezekiah, and were actually still around in the book of Esther. When you have Haman the Agagite, Agag was one of the generals of the Amalekite people. And so the Amalekites were never wiped away until later. But actually, this is not a mistake. This is not that God commanded, Joshua failed, David failed, Hezekiah failed. No. It says in verse 16, notice the major ends in 14 and 16 is about the judgment of the Amalekites. First of all, it's stated in verse 14, I will completely butt out the name of Amalek from under heaven. And then in verse 16, which is the key here, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. In other words, this was a holy war directive. There was to be carried not in the immediate battle, not even in subsequent battles, but it was to be carried out throughout the Old Testament period. And God did that. In other words, God is there. Now, this gets us into an issue that, wow, not enough time. I'm supposed to be done in the next seven or eight minutes. Holy war. How do you deal with holy war in two minutes? We will see. <laughs> Let me just say a few things about holy war in the Old Testament. The most important thing is that holy war can only be called by God. That's the terrible mistake of the jihadists in the Muslim land. Thinking that a mere petty war leader can call jihad. No, only God calls it. And nobody else. Israel was nothing more than the instrument used by God to carry it out his war. It was God's war. Not Israel's war. And not everyone was 
erased from the face of the earth. So that brings us to the, to the next couple of points. Always, holy war is directed to a completely evil people who are beyond redemption. These are those who have committed horrendous sins against God, including, of course, sacrificing the children, and in a couple of cases in the Old Testament, even cannibalism. But these are people who have gotten so evil that God is going to remove them from the face of the earth. Again, it's a divine directive. It's directed only to those who are totally consumed by evil. Therefore, that nation, like the Amal Amalekites, have really committed, in effect, the unpardonable sin of Mark 3.29, that Christ called there an eternal sin. So they've committed an eternal sin. They are beyond the pale. They will destroy the people of God if they are not, in a sense, absolutely destroyed. Therefore, they have to go. The final point I want to make is that actuality, holy war, and the total blotting out of a people is actually a proleptic anticipation, a harbinger of the final judgment. That's what's actually going on here. In a very real sense, this is the first step towards eternal punishment, towards eternal judgment. And one set of peoples are deemed so evil that God is going to give them, in a very real sense, their final judgment early. And so they are removed from the face of the earth. Many, many have said that the God of the Old Testament is not a God of love. That he's not a God that can be loved. That he's not a God that is worth worshiping. That is to totally misunderstand the entire concept of holy war. Because God's purpose in holy war is to purify the world he has created. And it's the first step in an evil that is so great it cannot be allowed to remain. See, therefore, it's a righteous God and a loving God. God loves the people of his creation enough to remove this evil presence and all the destruction. Therefore, at the same time, too, holy war is directed not just to a nation like the Amalekites. It's primarily directed to the cosmic powers who are the gods of that nation and who are behind that nation. And so it's really ultimate spiritual warfare. At times, it is done immediately. At other times, sometimes it's not carried out. Israel has failed. In this context, no, God is going to carry this out in the generations to come. But it is his intention. All right, let's now move. That is the future directive. Now we come to the present aspect in verse 15, where Moses then, like Abraham, like Jacob, erects an altar. Just like Bethel, Hebron, and the others. And as in many of them, he names it. And he names it Yahweh Nissi, the Lord is my banner. Now, Nissi, the banner, here actually refers to a signal pole or the standard on the pole, the battle flag. And it's, uh, that's the way it can be translated. It's a, a standard, a banner that actually functions as a standard, very much like the standards of armies. And the point of it is, this story becomes the standard flying above Israel. And that's exactly in keeping with the staff that was held up for the soldiers to look up upon. Now the story is a banner, an, a standard flying high that down through history, the people of God, including us this morning, can look upon and be encouraged because we can rely upon the God who will never let us down, the God who will never leave us, never forsake us, the God who is there and the God who will bring victory out of his people, the God who alone can ensure that all things work together for good, even the tragic events, many of which I'm sure many of you think of the same say, God hasn't shown me how this is going to work together for good, and that's true so often. That's Hebrews well, uh, Hebrews 11, rather, the roll call of the heroes of faith who never saw the answers to their prayers until after they saw it all. All things will work together for good, but many of us, on many, we're going to wait until we get to heaven to find out what that good was. I can think of several things where I say, I have not seen any good. The answer is we will. We will. God never fails. 
His victory is absolute. He, and, and that's the promise. His presence, his extraordinary presence, his unfathomable power is here right now. In the situation you're thinking of, in Israel as they fought the Amalekites, and throughout the wilderness, God never fails. And the question is, what will we be? Let me do one final thing. I know I'm running just a couple minutes late, but I do want to do one thing about verse 16, primarily because my translation is not the same as the NIV that was read. Okay, there, the actual Hebrew is, the hands are raised up upon the throne of Yahweh. The question is, whose hands and how are they laid upon the throne of Yahweh? So there's two possibilities. It could be the one that's in the text that you had read this morning. The hands of the Amalekites are raised up against the throne of the Lord, so God will be at war. Or it can, and I think it's a little more likely because it functions as the moral of the story. It concludes this. The hands of Moses are raised up upon the throne of the Lord. See, the Hebrew fits both. So the question is, which one is more likely? The hands of the Amalekites are against, or as I think, a slightly more likely because it concludes and provides the, the true meaning of it all. And the true meaning of this is not just holy war. That's a side issue. The primary issue is God with his people. So I prefer to translate it, the hands of Moses are raised up upon the throne. Therefore, God will fight for them. Not just now, but see, this is the promise. God will fight them against the Amalekites and all their enemies from generation to generation. God will always be in charge. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.